Good afternoon, folks. I'm going to start by running a short audio clip from a band called Great Big C. Don't worry, you'll have plenty of time to uh, be bored by me uh, and be bored by the sound of my voice. I just have to position it to the right spot. Two recruiting sergeants came to the CLB for the sons of the merchants to join the Blue Patines. So all hands enlisted, 500 young men. Enlist you Newfoundlanders and come follow me. Now, blue patees were issued to the regiment in Newfoundland, uh, not because they wanted to be distinctive, but because there was a shortage of khaki. Uh, when they arrived in England, the troops were issued standard khaki uniforms. This is a map of Newfoundland and Labrador. The island itself is approximately half the size of Great Britain. When you add Labrador, which is the mainland portion of the province, or at that time the Dominion in, it swells to two thirds again as large as Great Britain. But at the outbreak of war, only about 4,500 people lived in Labrador. There are over 17,000 kilometers of coastline in the area. They didn't have a great military tradition. They were the oldest British colony, but salt cod was an extremely important mainstay of diets, especially in Newfoundland itself. Fencibles were homeland defense units. During the War of 1812, the Newfoundlanders, against the Americans, of course, the Newfoundlanders served in Quebec uh, to defend that area, to defend the mainland. So they didn't have a garrison. They didn't have a militia standing army navy. They did have the Royal Navy Reserve. But it's hard to imagine how they might have been more militarily unprepared. I thought it's important that you see a few demographics about the uh, Dominion. Total population, less than 250,000. Only one city with over 5,000 residents and that was the capital of St. John's. Most of the population lived in the outports which were along the coastline in fishing communities and in mining communities inland. So, they found out that war was declared, that they had declared war when Great Britain declared war because as a uh, dominion, they automatically went to war with Great Britain. The governor responded was, we'll send 500 men. He didn't bother to consult other colony leaders or the legislature. The prime minister backed him and didn't call the legislature to consider the matter. And then they found out that they have to double that number of men in order to form a distinct unit. Otherwise, the men would likely just be served and fed in as reserve units or as filler into other regiments. There was public support to the war. Um, the first Newfoundland regiment was governed its governance, equipment, and maintenance was unique, probably, in that it wasn't a government responsibility. The Provincial Archives in Newfoundland, which is called The Rooms, notes that by doing so, the government hoped to deflect responsibility for any economic fallback that would occur. Governments trying to protect themselves from bad PR? I can't imagine such a thing. As the war dragged on, it became necessary to have conscription because there weren't as many volunteers to refill the ranks. Tim Cook is the World War I historian at the Canadian War Museum. Um, he noted this thing, and you'll hear Cook's name again and again throughout the presentation. The priest's attitude was typical. The St. John's Daily News declared that we are warring in the cause of righteousness, truth, and justice. 
Now, that's not to say that there weren't some misgivings. There was resistance to men from the fisheries to enlist. As fishery workers, they were what they were in what would now be known as essential service. And that topic did, or that concept didn't exist in the First World War. Uh, whole factories practically volunteered in the UK, which meant a shortage of men, trained men for industry and also for agriculture. Um, additionally, if men weren't working on the fisheries, their whole families would potentially suffer. The concern about the cost wasn't unreasonable, although as it turned out, it wasn't a problem during the war because fish prices and government revenues were high. Later, Coker joined the government and voted in favor of conscription. Ultimately, the desire to do the right thing overcame any opposition. In a special session of the legislature on September 2nd to discuss the colony's contribution, the leader of the opposition stated, this is not a time when we should think of party differences. This is a time when our land calls for united action. So picture on the right is the enlistment advertisement run on August 22nd. Within a month, Davidson's first or Donaldson's first 500 men had enlisted. John Gallishaw was a Harvard University student who returned to Newfoundland. He enlisted, was invalid at home from Gallipoli, and wrote a 1916 book about his experiences. He recorded that a corps of doctors asked impertinent questions concerning men's ancestors, inspected teeth, measured and pounded chests, demanded gymnastic stunts, and finally sorted out the best for the first contingent. The disappointed ones were consoled by news of another contingent to follow in six weeks. Some men turned down for minor defects, immediately went to hospital, were treated, and enlisted in the next contingent. St. John's contributed the bulk of the men, certainly in the initial stage and over half throughout the entire war. In the absence of a well-developed road system, boats were often needed to transport men, but they were often busy on the fisheries. And when recruiters went out, the men in the boats weren't there oftentimes. But 83% of the Naval Reserve volunteers came from the outports rather than from the city of St. John's. And they didn't form a PALS brigade, but there were four church groups the Anglican Church Lads Brigade, the Catholic Gazette Corps, the Methodist Guards, and the Presbyterian Newfoundland Highlanders. All of these groups instructed their men in drilling and had familiarized themselves with military type discipline. So here's a picture of them doing target practice. You can note the variety of outfits and that some of the men are wearing puttees presumably blue. Um, the only picture, colorized picture, is one that was recolored by the rooms showing the blue puttees. And here is a picture of them at bayonet practice. And note that it's the 1st Newfoundland Regiment. So the time came for them to leave. So within uh, a month and a half of being enlisted, they were on a boat to England, the first 500. The ship is the Florizel. Um, apparently it was a converted fisheries boat, which stank to high heaven, making for a less than pleasant trip to the UK. Eventually the regiment consisted of a recruiting battalion in St. John's, a depot battalion in Air, and the overseas service battalion. Training occurred at Salisbury Plain, at Fort George near Inverness, at Stobbs Camp near Hawick, and finally at Aldershot. And remember that the war was expected to be over by Christmas. Almost every man agreed to extend their enlistment for the duration of the war when they're reviewed on, reviewed on August 12th by the King and Lord Kitchener at Aldershot. 
I'm not talking about the Canadians. I'm talking about the Newfoundlanders, but I'm going to spend two slides on the Canadian contribution. Um, at Ypres, they tenaciously held off the Germans when the French Algerian troops on their flank routed following the first gas attack of the war, uh, leaving a gap in the line. On April 24th, the Canadian withstood a direct gas attack and continued to hold until relieved. Meanwhile, the Blue Petits remained in England. The Newfoundland authorities forbade its being attached to the Canadian division or under Canadian command. So Canada had vastly greater population and mustered many more troops than Newfoundland. The capture of Vimy Ridge uh, is considered a foundational moment in Canadian history. It had earlier withstood both French and English assaults. Such was the reputation that their troop movements were hidden as far as possible, particularly do, during the Hundred Days in 1918 in order to conceal where the next attack would occur. Their casualty figures, about 39% of the troops mobilized were killed or wounded. And some of you may have seen the Canadian War, World War I Memorial at Vimy itself. But what to do with the Newfoundlanders? This is a quote from Galishaw's book, Trenching at Gallipoli. Everybody else is getting into the game and winning all sorts of credit. What about us? Well, in, during the royal inspection, according to Galishaw, Kitchener announced that the Newfoundlanders were, quote, just the men I want for the Dardanelles. And this is a picture of A Company prior to its deployment. So off to the fight. Uh, his HMT, His Majesty's troopship, or His Majesty's transport, or hired military transport. Um, I suspect in the case of the Megantic, it was hired military transport. So they arrived in Egypt and then fraternized with the Anzacs. Galashaw says that about a quarter mile across the desert from us was a camp for convalescent Australians and New Zealanders. As soon as the Australians found that we were colonials like themselves, they opened their hearts to us in the breezy way that is characteristically Australian. There's a Canadian hospital unit in Cairo. It was not an uncommon thing to see on a Cairo street, a group composed of an Australian, a New Zealander, a Canadian and a Newfoundlander. And once we managed to break up a South African. So finally, they arrived at Suvla. One book reported that only 933 men landed but it's hard to conceive why the loss of 10% of the unit would not have gone mentioned. So what was the state of the campaign when they got there? Well, for most in intents and purposes, the campaign was over. It just needed to end. The Newfoundlanders were straining for action, admittedly, but they were also unblooded troops who were colonial troops who were being sent to what had become a backwater of the war. A cynic might wonder if they were deemed expendable in the greater scheme of things. It's a harsh thing to say, but you have to wonder. Where were they in the line? Well, trenching at Gallipoli mentions that they took over part of a trench near Anfarda and the Essex Ravine is noted in the Regimental War Diary as where they went when they weren't on duty. You recognize, I'm sure, the great the Salt Lake there. Um, so you have some idea of their positioning. And here it is in more detail with some of the locations highlighted. Borderers Knoll will feature in the story later. British lines in blue, Turkish lines in purple. So, 
Fortunately for me, the rooms holds a copy of the regimental diary. For the most part, it details a life of monotony and boredom enlivened by snipers and by shell fire. Down towards the end of September, they, in the attack on September 28th, shell fire was called down from the batteries at Suvla and from the ships at sea to break up the Turkish assaults. The 1921 book, The First 500, which is a history of the regiment in the First World War, notes that comparatively few of the enemy were left to be held up by rifle fire. Now, the Newfoundlanders were by no means seasoned troops, but somewhat skittish. Tim Cook recounts a letter from a soldier indicating that after shooting an English officer the night before, they were sent out on patrol without their rifles. And here are a couple of pictures of people serving in the trenches. And all these are from the rooms. The slide title is from the book, The First 500. Unburied corpses, of course, provide an en environment for the development of disease. Before October 11th, the practice had been for half the regiment to go into the line. Afterwards, all of it was required because they were so shorthanded. Many troops were invalided home or sent back for disease as unfit for service, some to England, some to Newfoundland. And another quote from the first 500, I can't imagine a worse possible scenario for an outbreak of dysentery. Due to chronic water shortages, men could rapidly dehydrate themselves. 80 tons of water had to be daily manhandled up to the lines to supply the troops under normal circumstances. Into the 11th, in and out, men wounded and killed with no outcome other than holding the line. Uh, Tim Cook describes this as wastage. Final note there uh, on uh, November 1st, concerns the commanding officer. His command was controversial. He was a British Army regular, apparently loved by the rank and file, who appreciated him standing up for them against other uh, senior officers, but disliked by many of his officers. He was loathed by political authorities in Newfoundland, especially Prime Minister Morris, who schemed to have him replaced. Burton had the temerity to offer promotions on the basis of merit. Uh, the war diary reports him as wounded on October 28th, where after he left the regiment. However, Cook wrote that he may have been wounded, invalided out by disease, or simply left the regiment. Cook goes on that soon after, the Army Council and Colonial Office made the Newfoundland government agree to respect all appointments made at the front and moreover, to affirm that promotions did not require the assent of the Newfoundland government. Bottom line, not out of military affairs. So things finally heat up a bit in November. Uh, at the start of the month, it's more the same. And then on November 4th, something different and unexpected happened the major action of the campaign for the regiment. And you'll see that it's a fairly piddling small event. Caribou Hill. Uh, the incidents of this, Caribou Hill was the location of a Turkish sniper post. And the details are taken from the diary of Lieutenant Owen W. Steele, which was included in the first 500. Apparently it was a relatively simple task to sneak into the post from the Newfoundlanders line during the daytime because they were screened from the Turkish lines. So the three Turk snipers arrived expecting to use the post as usual. They were ambushed and either two or three of them were slain, but the NCO was wounded. He went back to the lines and requested reinforcement and reinforcements were sent out. They encountered fierce opposition in the form of a Turkish patrol. Of the seven-man relief force, 
One man was killed and four wounded. Uh, the 29th Division Diary said they lost their way and blundered close to the Turkish lines, which was the reason for the engagement. Now, Heinz and Green were unwounded. They managed to success sufficiently intimidate the Turks into withdrawing and returned with the wounded to the lines. The fate of the first detachment was still unknown. The following day, Donnelly's detachment was found to still be in possession of the sniper post. It was strongly reinforced and a more senior officer put in charge. And the front line was finally incorporated the former sniper post. This excerpt and the subsequent ones are from the 29th Division War Diary. It was provided to me by a former colleague at the university where I worked in London, uh, David Mercer, who now works at Memorial University in Newfoundland. So this is the summary from the 29th Division. Somewhat unexpected, lots of noise, lots of bother. Now there were medals awarded. Donnelly was awarded the Military Cross. He probably hadn't intended to extend the line, but he was credited with having done so. This is a picture of Green, and both Green's and Hines medals were also awarded for conspicuous gallantry. And those are synopses of the uh, citations that they received. What was the reaction in Newfoundland? Well, they were desperate for glory. Their boys had been doing nothing. And damn it, this is their moment. Uh, he's the hero of the hour. And it was trumpeted. It was blown out of all significance, far from being a turning point in the campaign. It changed nothing. There were two poems penned. I will spare you most of the first verses, but felt it appropriate to inflict some suffering on you. Uh, so here goes. With eight whose grit the Sultan's horde defied and whose renown in song and story through the years emblazoned shall go down. That's enough, I think, and probably more than enough. So this is a picture of Caribou Hill. It's from the room's record for Lance Corporal Frederick Ernest Snow, who was later killed uh, at the Somme. It adds with respect to the picture, since then it has been difficult to retrace and to identify the exact site, even though the terrain has apparently not changed a great deal. Now, Frank Gogos uh, collaborated with David Mercer, or David collaborated with Frank, and they did locate it and their location that was announced as such in the telegram uh, on in September 2015. So this is a map from the book, The First 500, which was 1921. And you can see the purple arrow indicates the square where Caribou Hill was. Unfortunately, the Newfoundlanders were uh, way north of that. So, I don't understand when the author presumably had access to veterans, how it could have been so badly mislocated. But that's a question that will remain forever. So this is the approximate location of Caribou Hill planted onto the trench map that we've seen before. Uh, the 29th Division Diary noted that it commanded the ravine between the knoll and C and D posts. So you can see the ravine going down there. So that's its approximate location. David Mercer, bless his soul, sent me a much needed map. Uh, I tried to overlay it onto the trench maps, but I couldn't get a close enough match to really show where it was. Um, Perhaps those of you who have walked the battlefield might be able to recognize the location of the yellow dot 
Um, it appears to be just north of a major road. And judging from the twist and turn in the road, I would think it's, I would guess without any authority that it's what appears to be a fairly densely forested area. Perhaps what was borderers know, I don't know. And this is the divisional summary about the month of November. Note that it called it Caribou Ridge, not Caribou Hill. But it was notable because taking the post and finding that there were other ones abandoned, cut down on the number of sniper casualties that they were suffering. So into November, the weather begins to deteriorate. Uh, both the first 500 and divisional diaries that uh, sniper casualties dropped, but wastage still continued. And the regimental diary said, heavy rainstorm, trenches flooded. Well, by contrast, the first 500 describes it as a disastrous form. The water was rushing over the slopes with a force that threatened to carry everything before it. So suddenly were the trenches turned into rushing rivers that men had to jump from them. In trenches that survived, men were waist deep in water, but whole trench systems were wiped out. Drenched men without coats, exposed to high winds and freezing temperatures. This sounds like the stuff of a disaster film, and indeed it was. Uh, these are snippets or summary again from Steele's diary records. Uh, the diary used a no longer acceptable term, so I battlerized it. Uh, note the national pride, the not a single fatality which speaks well for the physique of our men, and then contrasts it with English battalions that were um, in the vicinity. Utter carnage from the storm. Neither side, again, Steele said, neither side bothered about the other in the least until the severity of the frost began to lessen. Men were too busy trying to stay alive to be bothered trying to kill each other. Uh, Steele said, even the water we had then was only muddy trench water in which we would not have attempted even to wash our hands under the normal circumstances. And they didn't suffer any deaths, but over 100, about 150 men were sent away with frost pits and feet. A number of them likely, depending on the severity, would never have returned to the regiment. One almost has to admire the terseness of the report. Uh, no mention of casualties, no mention of uh, anything, just a number of the shelters were swept away and made useless. Longer term outcomes of the storm, well, the intense cold killed the flies and the rain and then the frost locked the contaminants into the soil. People stopped getting sick unless they uh, drank contaminated water that had already been uh, collected. These, these statements are a contention of the author of the first 500. I see no reason to argue or disagree. However, you people know the campaign much better than I did and may be able to provide better information or to say, well, no, they didn't plan, they were already planning it even before the storm. And then in November, back to business as usual. Now, after the storm, there was a change in command. Nothing indicates that a Newfoundlander was ready for regimental command. Talented Canadian officers such as Curry were promoted to high rank. So I suspected that the first Newfoundland regiment needed an outsider to be brought in. Cook wrote that in 1964, Hadda recalled, recalled in an oral history that 
The narrow outlook of the islander was difficult to navigate, with those at home never forgetting the claim to be the oldest British colony and all the complexities of dealing with the three religious denominations, Roman Catholic, Protestant, and nonconformists. I had a complaint in a letter from the governor that one of these were not getting their fair share of promotions. Cook described Hadda as having had thicker skin than Butler, but the, that he was worn out emotionally and physically by 1917. War pirate diary page is missing. I confirmed that with the rooms. Uh, so I can't bore you with the recitation of numbers again. Although I didn't set out to make the presentation as boring as the, as the campaign by giving a day-to-day -day recital, I eventually felt some symmetry in doing so. Up to 400 men. Well, they started in September with 1,000. The Newfoundland Regiment was one of the units designated to pretend that the lines were as occupied as usual. By 2 a.m. on the 20th, the entire regiment had embarked. But on the 24th, it was back on the peninsula, this time to do manual labor while under constant shell fire as they prepared for the second evacuation. In January, they made a staged withdrawal. The Canadian Encyclopedia article that notes that a group of men by, led by Lieutenant Steele, whose diary we've seen, were among the soldiers on the last barge to leave the peninsula. Uh, First 500 says they were the final troops, even if <laughs> they weren't the last troops off, their role in the two evacuations was important, very important. Brigadier General Cayley wrote to the governor of Newfoundland in the evacuation of Suvla and Hellas operations, of which the success depended entirely upon the steadiness and discipline of the troops taking part, their share in these extremely anxious movements was ad most admirably performed. So what was the butcher's bill? Roughly 10% killed or wounded. Uh, and that, of course, doesn't count disease, which losses were very heavy. And in fact, most of the losses were from disease. It took a long time to rebuild its strength. Uh, by the end of um, February, they were about half strength, what they'd been when they arrived in the in, in and this striking picture was sent to me by David Mercer. I had no idea even of ex existence. It shows 47 men died of disease or wounds, which doesn't reconcile with either of the other counts I've seen of 39 or 40. Maybe it's men who died subsequently of their wounds again after evacuation. Certainly the Canadian military reported the number of war dead as finalized as of 1920. The inscription in the middle is that these honored dead shall not have died, shall not have bled in vain. Excuse me. Well, the regiment survived Gallipoli, but the song was waiting for them. On July 1st, they participated at Beaumont Hamel. Their objective, uh, they were supposed to set up from the front lines, but there were problems with the communication trenches, so they couldn't. So they were 200, started from 250 yards behind the front line. They were part of the second wave, the first having been launched and defeated at 7.30. What needs to be said? I'm going to play another short clip from Great Big C's The Recruiting Sergeant. And I just have to position the sound right.
London for the last July drive. To the trenches with the regiment, prepare yourself to die. The roll call next morning, just a handful survived. Enlist your Newfoundlanders and come follow me. And it's over the mountains and over the sea. Come brave Newfoundlanders and join the Blue Patis. You'll fight the hunted Flanders and that Gallipoli. Enlist your Newfoundlanders and come follow me. I thought it appropriate to include these sound clips because they were the first time I ever knew that the Newfoundlanders participated at Gallipoli when I first heard that song. The Caribou statue at Beaumont ML was the first of six erected at various battlefields in Europe to commemorate the Blue Petits. And Gallipoli now has its own caribou. The premier of Newfoundland, Andrew Fury, spoke of the final statue Completing the Trail of the Caribou is an historic moment for Newfoundland and Labrador. The installation of the final caribou is the culmination of a tremendous effort made by many over a number of years. Much gratitude to the Government of Canada and the Republic of Turkey for recognizing the significance of the caribou monument to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador and allowing us to properly pay tribute to the Newfoundland regiments Royal Newfoundland Regiment's service and sacrifice. This is a picture of uh, Hugh Walter McWhorter, who was the first man killed on September 22nd. Given that eight other people were wounded the same day, I would suspect shell fire. Um, Ian located both his picture and a newspaper clipping from October 12th when his death was reported. Uh, sadly, the paper identified him as Hugh William McWhorter, not Walter. So, footnotes to the campaign. 25% of the men who served died. 40% were wounded. The Premier called it the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. It wasn't when it was at Gallipoli. That didn't happen until 1917. I guess that Suffering almost 90% casualties at the Somme wasn't a sufficient show of valor and devotion. Uh, Morris also received a peerage. He was the only Dominion Prime Minister who was so recognized. The regiment still exists today. Newfoundland formed no separate unit in the Second World War, but men enlisted with the Canadian and British forces. Uh, pension and medical responsibilities largely bankrupted the colony. Um, also responsible, of course, was the collapse in the price of fish and, as a minor detail, the Great Depression. A plurality of votes in the first referendum supported local responsible government, a return to what had been before 1934. Uh, the second referendum pitted local government against union with Canada. Union received 52% support, which is a lower percentage than remaining in the UK got in the Scottish referendum. According to Cook, as a result, July 1st has an ambiguous role for Newfoundland. It's simultaneously proof of its devotion to Britain and the day it's conceded its independence to Canada. Quoting from the university website, it was established as a memorial to the Newfoundlanders who lost their lives on active service during the First World War and subsequent conflicts. Marine Atlantic on their website acknowledges the source of the name. The vessel shows valor and determination of a different kind. The wind on its route on August 11th, when I checked, were 54 knots per hour. And finally, I'd like to make a few acknowledgements. I'll thank Ian for having asked me to participate in order to have a colonial perspective. And for both sending me the Tim Cook article and reminding me about it. David's assistance greatly enhanced the, the presentation. 
And finally, you folks for humoring a dilettante in the story of Philippi. And if you're interested, the final slide is some of the principal sources used. <laughs>